After he had acquired his own party newspaper, the Volkische Beobachter, Hitler intensified his recruiting drive. The times were ideal for such a campaign. There were violent strikes, communist uprisings, and general disorder throughout the country. The rate of unemployment remained high and wages were low. The German economy labored under the weight of the reparations payments, which the Treaty of Versailles required Germany to make to the victorious powers. The impoverished country found it impossible to meet these large payments, since the treaty also blocked Germany out of most export markets. In addition to the international problems, the inflation was already underway. The German mark, normally valued at 4 to the US dollar began to fall. By the summer of 1921 it had dropped to 75 to the dollar. Personal savings of a lifetime were rapidly becoming valueless. Fixed incomes no longer sufficed to pay for vital necessities. Many small businesses were going bankrupt. The middle class was desperate. As Hitler's following increased in size, the Marxist parties became alarmed. They warned the workers to stay away from Nazi public meetings. However, Hitler's ranting denunciations of the Versailles Treaty, the inflation, and Germany's humiliation by the Allies were too compelling to miss hearing. So workers, artisans, shopkeepers, and the unemployed came to hear him in spite of all threats and warnings. Violence erupted at Hitler's meetings. He organized Nazi defense squads to silence hecklers and beat up disruptors. It was not long before Nazis and communists were fighting in the streets. Important rightist leaders watched this developing struggle carefully. Hitler's party looked like the only nationalist movement capable of winning over the lower classes. If it could hold its own against the communists, it would prove itself a party worthy of considerable financial support. The Nazi Party's defense squads were a poorly disciplined group of volunteer brawlers, until they were reorganized in the summer of 1921 under the camouflage name Gymnastic and Sports Division. On October 5, 1921, they were officially named the Storm Troopers, from which the title SA came. The SA uniform, the brown shirt, was somewhat accidental. It originated when the party was able to purchase cheaply, a surplus lot of khaki army shirts once intended to have been worn in Africa. Naturally, equipping and arming a paramilitary unit like the SA cost a great deal of money. Since many of the members were unemployed, they often had to be provided with food and shelter as well. The party itself could not supply such funds, for it needed every available cent for its own upkeep and propaganda costs. Who then financed the SA? Fortunately Kurt Ludek, the man who subsidized one of the first elite storm troop companies wrote a detailed account of his activities. Ludek had joined the National Socialists on August 12, 1922, 
the day after his friend Count Ernst Reventlav had taken him to hear one of Hitler's speeches. After being a party member for a short time he became aware of the lack of military discipline in the SA at that time. He said the stormtroopers were little better than gangs. If he could form an elite well-disciplined company of stormtroopers, he thought that their example might prove an inspiration to the rest of the SA. Hitler listened to his plan and told him to go ahead. Ludek began recruiting, accepting only the toughest and most able-bodied men who had either served in the war or had some military training. Two former army officers were appointed as platoon leaders. Every new member took an oath of allegiance on the swastika flag and pledged loyalty to Hitler. In addition to being the leader of a stormtroop company, Kurt Ludek worked as a party fundraiser. The job of being Hitler's representative in high society was not an easy one. His efforts to gain the support of wealthy and educated men brought many headaches and few results. It was easier to win over a hundred common men than to convert a single gentleman. The more educated the man, the greater his academic resistance to the impossible and undignified program advocated by such an uncultivated radical as Hitler. One of the principal sources of money and equipment for the SA was the secret army funds originally set up to finance free corps units and military intelligence work. However, up to now, historians have incorrectly assumed that assistance was given to Hitler on the orders of the high command of the Bavarian army. Actually, most of the aid was given to Hitler on the initiative of one officer, Captain Ernst Röhm, without the knowledge or approval of his superiors. The technique Rome used to channel army money and material to Hitler was one that has become very popular in recent decades. Two privately owned corporations were created, one dependent on the other. The basic corporation, the very existence of which was top secret, was the Felsjugmeisterii, directed by Ernst Röhm. The other, the dependent corporation, was the Faber Motor Vehicle Rental Service, operated openly as a business by Major Wilhelm Faber, who was under Rome's command. Rome had the initial approval of his military superiors in setting up these corporations because they were an ideal cover for concealing extra armaments and vehicles forbidden by the Versailles Treaty. The corporations also served the purpose of making this illegal equipment available to the clandestine reserve army free corps units. But as the year 1922 went on, Rome began to channel more and more money, equipment, arms and even trucks and cars to the Nazis through the Faber Motor Vehicle Rental Service. At first the senior officers of the Bavarian army were not aware of the increased amount of aid being given to Hitler because Rome's corporations functioned so secretly that even the army command received no reports of their activities. It was not until 1923 that the army commander, General von Lorso, and the Bavarian government discovered the extent of Rome's activities. But even then it was some time before they could actually slow down the flow of aid to the Nazis, because Rome's corporations were staffed by men whose primary loyalty was to him personally rather than to the army. In addition, Rome's companies functioned legally as independent business entities and were not technically subject to the authority of the army. The reason the army did not simply arrest Rome for stealing government property was that Rome as liaison officer with the Free Corps and Black Reichswehr, had many influential friends, and so it would have been impossible to get rid of him without an outcry of public protest and a full-scale investigation. The year 1922 saw the German mark fall to 400 to the US dollar. The runaway inflation was beginning. Every day meant an increase in prices as resentment against the government spread. The discontented middle class began to swell the ranks of Hitler's movement. As the German economic situation grew worse, the financial position of the National Socialist Party grew stronger. 
In November of 1921 the party had moved into a new and larger headquarters and by April of the following year it already had 13 full-time salaried employees. A central archive and filing system was developed under the direction of the party business manager Max Amon. On the evening of November 22, 1922, a Harvard graduate, Ernst Hans Stangeil, whose mother was American and whose cultivated wealthy family owned an art publishing business in Munich, attended one of Hitler's speeches on the advice of Captain Truman Smith, the assistant military attaché of the United States. Opposed to communism and appalled by Germany's present weaknesses, Hans Stangeil was captivated with Hitler's oratory. A few days later he joined the party. The six-foot-four-inch Hans Stangeil, whose nickname Putzi ironically meant little fellow in Bavarian dialect, shared Hitler's interest in art and music and became his frequent companion. Hans Stangeil received partial payment for his share of the family art gallery in New York, which had been closed during the war. The money came to only $1,500, but that represented an absolute fortune when converted into depreciated marks. There were two American rotary presses for sale. If their purchase could be financed, it would mean that the Nazi Party newspaper could come out as a daily in a full-size format. With Hans Stangeil bankrolling the sale, Hitler could scarcely believe his luck. Along with the French occupation of the Ruhr, Germany's primary steel manufacturing region, came the total collapse of the German currency. The government had to pour financial support into the Ruhr for the hundreds of thousands whom passive resistance had put out of work. In order to meet this enormous obligation, more money was printed. It is often incorrectly assumed that this was the beginning of the inflation. Actually, the inflation began during the war. In England, war expenses had been financed by increased taxation, but in Germany mounting expenditures were met by printing more currency. The process was accelerated after the war. First prices doubled, then tripled. The government told the people the inflation was an economic process over which no one had any control. In reality however, the inflation was the method chosen by the German financial elite to escape their obligations and push off the burden onto the middle class. When prices doubled because more currency was being circulated, the real value of savings accounts, pensions, and bonds were cut in half, but few people realized it at the time. Financing the passive resistance in the Ruhr provided the government with the excuse it needed to begin the runaway inflation. The mark fell to 10,000 to the dollar and then to 50,000. Prices began to rise daily and then twice a day. The hardest hit were the good, solid middle-class citizens, who had saved for the future and suddenly saw all they had worked for wiped out overnight. Bills of increasingly higher denomination were printed. Factories began paying twice a week because the value of the money diminished so much from Monday to Saturday. On paydays the wives of the workers waited outside the factory gates. As soon as the men were paid, they rushed out and gave the money to the women who hurried off to the nearest store to buy things before the value of the money went down further. But at least the pay of industrial workers, most of whom belonged to unions, was adjusted somewhat to the declining value of the mark. The middle class was harder hit. More than a few professional men found it impossible to support themselves on incomes eroded by the inflation. They were forced to take jobs at night as cab drivers and waiters in order to survive. Many people driven to the wall by the inflation put their property up for sale at a stated price according to the value of the mark at the time. But when the legal formalities were completed and the deal closed, the worth of the mark had further deteriorated to the point where the purchaser acquired a home worth $20,000 for the equivalent of $1,000. Financiers and large companies with unlimited credit took advantage of these conditions to accumulate vast holdings at very little cost. Big business found the inflation extremely profitable. Mortgages were paid off, bonds retired, and debts wiped out with inflated marks worth only a fraction of their former real value. Hitler was one of the few politicians who correctly assessed the inflation as a deliberate campaign to defraud the middle class of their savings. 
representatives of the established political parties were always telling the people no one had any control over the inflation, but to have confidence and the mark would not fall any lower. When Hitler's predictions about the inflation began to come true, his speeches attracted bigger and bigger audiences. Because he exposed this one fraud, many people thought he was a man of honesty and sincerity. As the value of the mark went down, the membership in the National Socialist Party went up, Almost nothing is known about the man who was the most important early fundraiser for the Nazi party, Max Erwin von Schäuble Richter. There is much confusion about his background, his profession, and his activities during World War I. Even during his life, Schäuble Richter was always a man of mystery. He took great pains never to appear in the limelight and always shrouded his activities in secret. Yet there is no doubt about his importance. He succeeded in raising enormous sums of money for the Nazi party. By 1923 his influence over Hitler was considerable and the party was dependent on him for most of its contacts in high society. During a failed coup d'état in Munich, the Beer Hall Putsch of November 9, 1923, he marched in the front rank of Nazi leaders, arm in arm with Hitler leading 2,000 fellow party members. When members of the Bavarian police opened fire, he was shot in the lungs, dying instantly, his fall dislocating Hitler's shoulder. Extremely disturbed by the death of Schäuble Richter, Hitler commented, the others are replaceable but not he. He was the only first-tier Nazi leader to die during the Beer Hall Putsch. Hitler first met him in October of 1920. Before the year was over he and his wife joined the Nazi party. Of even greater importance was Schäuble Richter's talent for getting donations for the movement. He was a genius at procuring funds even during this time of economic crisis when money was not easy to come by in Germany. He approached Bavarian aristocrats, big businessmen, bankers, and leaders of heavy industry, such as steel magnate Fritz Thyssen and mining magnate Paul Reusch. He was even said to have received a contribution from the House of Wittelsbach, and on several occasions General Ludendorff channeled money to him from industrialists. He also received large contributions from Russian industrialists, especially the oil barons who had been able to transfer some part of their fortunes to Germany. Once Hitler's cause was taken up by Russian grand dukes, counts, and generals, he automatically became more acceptable in the eyes of the upper-class Germans. When Frau Beckstein came to Munich, she and her husband invited Hitler to dinner in their luxurious hotel suite. A domineering and possessive woman, Frau Beckstein thought she could tell the shy Hitler how to dress, behave, and even how to conduct his political affairs. But she, like so many women after her, made the mistake of underestimating his determination and independence. He would sit alone with her for hours explaining his political ideas. In return for her generous donations he was even willing to let her call him my little wolf. In society, Hitler behaved in a somewhat awkward but not unpleasant fashion. Contrary to the stories printed in several Munich newspapers, Hitler did not throw fits in private or have the manners of a gangster. Many people, especially women, were charmed by him. Usually he would present his hostess with an extravagantly large bouquet of roses, and bow to kiss her hand in the dramatic old Viennese fashion. He was careful never to sit down before they were seated. Even his voice changed when speaking with women. Elsa Bruckmann, the wife of the well-known publisher Hugo Bruckmann, was also one of Hitler's early supporters. Her husband's company had a great deal of influence in right-wing circles and published the books of Houston Stuart Chamberlain, one of the most popular nationalist authors at the time. Frau Bruckmann, who was born Princess Kontakuzen of Romania, had a great deal of money and was known to frequently give Hitler contributions. In return however, she was very demanding of his attention. Frau Winifred Wagner, the English-born wife of Siegfried Wagner, Richard Wagner's son, was one of the first few hundred to join the Nazi party. She became one of Hitler's personal friends and a contributor to his cause. Moreover, 
she used the influence of her name wherever possible to help get money for the party. On April 3, 1923, the Munich Post carried a story about women who were infatuated with Hitler, and lent or gave him money. In many instances their contributions did not take the form of cash, instead, wealthy patrons presented him with valuable objects of art and jewelry to dispose of as he saw fit. Frau Helene Beckstein stated that in addition to the regular financial support given by her husband to the leader of the National Socialist Party, she herself had made sizable contributions, not in the form of money, but rather objects of art, which he could sell or do anything he liked with. At first Hitler had considerable respect for the upper-class people he met in soliciting contributions. Germany was the most class-conscious country in Western Europe and being from lower middle-class origins himself, Hitler was careful to address aristocrats and officers with all ceremonial politeness. In high society his naivete was an asset as well as a drawback. By 1923 the runaway inflation was leaving distress and chaos in its wake. Workers were making millions of marks a week and had to carry their salaries home in bags. But the price of food was rising faster than wages and people were beginning to go hungry. The savings of the middle class melted to nothing. The money they had invested before the war in bonds of the government, the German states, and the municipalities was also lost. Financially the middle class was wiped out. The day that Hitler had foretold was coming to pass, the paper money was almost totally worthless now. More than 300 paper mills and over 2,000 printing presses were operating on a 24-hour basis just to supply paper money, most of which had printing only on one side. The banks were actually using the blank side of the money for scratch paper because it was cheaper than purchasing scratch pads for the purpose. The runaway inflation destroyed the people's confidence in the government. The frightened upper class suddenly became more receptive to Hitler's pleas for money. He made several trips to Berlin to solicit contributions and in Munich he frequently made the rounds of prominent conservative citizens. Sometimes he would take his friend Hans Stangl along to give an added touch of respectability to these begging expeditions. Although Hitler received no large monetary contributions after his speeches to the Munich businessmen, his efforts were not wasted. Hermann Orst, a lawyer and Alfred Kulo, president of the Bavarian Association of Industrialists amongst others were very influential in local conservative circles. A few weeks later the most important of the city's conservative newspapers, the Milken and Neueste Nochristen, which had been pro-democratic in the first years of the Weimar Republic, began to accord Hitler favorable publicity. At the same time the Mtschina Zeitung, another respectable conservative paper, suddenly turned pro-Nazi. Thus, men who had influence behind the scenes could contribute more important things than just cash. Ernest Hemingway, who was then a reporter in Europe, wrote of spending four days at a deluxe German resort hotel with a party of four. The bill, including tips, came to millions of marks or 20 cents a day in American money. Germany was invaded by a host of inflation profiteers. Swiss, Dutch, Czech, Italian, and Austrian money circulated freely and possessed a high purchasing power when converted to inflation marks. Hitler, by obtaining these currencies, found an excellent way to help keep the party financially afloat during this period. Comparatively small donations from sympathizers and Germans in other countries instantly became sums of importance when the stable foreign currencies were brought into inflation-torn Germany. Switzerland was an excellent source of funds, and the Nazis played on every possible appeal to get a few Swiss francs. Hitler himself went on several fund-raising tours in Switzerland. Besides the aristocrats, businessmen, and white Russians, there remained one other group from which Hitler received money? Naval intelligence. This is a most unexpected source, partly because its motives were less obvious than those of other contributors. One must recall that the German central government had decided that the best method to thwart Bavarian separatism was to use the navy as an agency through which support could be given to the nationalist movements in Bavaria, such as the Nazis. This gave rise to one of the most complex and mysterious cases of covert funding. 
Involved in this case was the man who was later to become known as a leader of the German resistance against Hitler, Admiral, then Lieutenant Commander, Wilhelm Canaris. Since intelligence agencies are expert at covering up any traces of their activities, the evidence that remains is rather sketchy. However, it is enough to definitely link Hitler, the organization consul, a right-wing terrorist unit of former naval officers, and funds of naval intelligence. This case is an excellent example of the dangers of unsupervised intelligence agencies. By mid-1923, German economic life was grinding to a standstill and many people were reverting to barter. Suicides were common among the middle class. Farmers were now refusing to sell their produce for the inflated paper money, as Hitler had predicted. Those who lived in cities were going hungry. The signs of malnutrition began to appear. Increasing cases of scurvy were reported. The size of the Nazi party was multiplying so rapidly it was difficult to determine the exact extent of the membership. In the fall of 1922 it was a little over 10,000. Less than a year later, estimates ran between 35,000 and 200,000, with sympathizers of at least 10 times this number. If elections had been held at that time, the National Socialists would probably have been the second strongest party in Bavaria. It was even said that a majority of the Munich police were Nazi supporters, which is not too surprising considering that the head of the police, Dr. Ernst Pohner, was a member of the Tula Society. Hitler's popularity was so great that he was allowed an appointment with General von Lorso, the commander of the army in Bavaria. At the time it was very unusual for a German general to meet formally with an ex-corporal, but, of course, Lorso knew Hitler had powerful backers and represented important interests. After their first conversation together the general was clearly impressed. Throughout the spring and summer of 1923 Hitler called on von Lorso almost daily. When General von Zeigt, the supreme commander of the Germany army, came from Berlin on his official inspection tour, he sat in Lorso's office for an hour and a half listening to the man Lorso termed a political prophet, Adolf Hitler. A few years ago Hitler had been a poorly paid army agent, now he was meeting the commanding generals as an equal. Germany's defeat left Hermann Göring disillusioned. One evening in November of 1922 he attended one of Hitler's speeches and was almost instantly converted. The next day Göring sought out Hitler to volunteer his services for the Nazi party. The two men talked together for some time. We spoke at once about the things which were close to our hearts, the defeat of our fatherland, the inequities of the Versailles Treaty, Goring said later. I told him that I myself to the fullest extent, and all that I possessed, were completely at his disposal. Hitler was overjoyed with his new recruit. Goring was a great war hero, and that would bring considerable prestige to the party. He was also from an aristocratic background and was a personal friend of high-ranking officers, counts, and even princes. Goring came from a wealthy family, but Germany's defeat and the inflation had left him virtually penniless. He was, however, living comfortably on the money of his wife, formerly Swedish Countess Karen von Kantzau, who turned out to be of great prestige value to the party. The presence of this beautiful, Aristocratic lady at Nazi rallies and parades made a good number of wealthy people re-examine their first impression of the Nazi party. If such a dignified noble woman is a supporter of Hitler, perhaps he isn't a danger to respectable people after all, they said to themselves. The Gorings Villa in Obermenzing, a suburb of Munich, became a gathering place for the leaders of the National Socialist Party. Hitler, who liked pretty women, was charmed by Karen Goring. She in return embraced the Nazi cause with all the fervor of her emotional temperament. Among the other visitors to the Goring villa was a man of the greatest importance, General Erich Ludendorff. Goring and his charming wife played a key role in getting the general to back Hitler. It is impossible to overestimate the prestige of Ludendorff's name in nationalist circles at the time. During the war he had been the quartermaster general of the German army with the virtual power of dictatorship over the country. Although he no longer held any official military post, 
free corps leaders and representatives of many rightist groups came to him for advice and guidance. At a German Day rally in Nuremberg on September 1st and 2nd, before almost 100,000 people, Ludendorff announced his support of Hitler's party. General Ludendorff himself had little money, but many prominent wealthy men looked upon him as Germany's senior military officer and consequently the true leader of all nationalist forces. There were industrialists and businessmen, such as Friedrich Mainu of the Stinnes firm, who wanted to support the anti-communist forces but knew very little about politics and still less about the strengths and weaknesses of the numerous right-wing groups. Consequently, they gave their money to Ludendorff, a man whose honesty they could trust and whose judgment they relied on, telling him to divide it among the nationalist forces as he saw fit. By 1923 a considerable portion of this money was finding its way to Hitler. In the fall of 1923 Fritz Thyssen, heir of the Thyssen Steel Empire and chairman of the board of the United Steel Works, the largest German steel corporation, attended one of Hitler's rallies. Thyssen, a man with strong right-wing sympathies, was impressed. I realized his oratorical gifts and his ability to lead the masses, Thyssen said. What impressed me most was the almost military discipline of his followers. Meanwhile, Germany was once again in a state of extreme political tension. Economic difficulties caused by the inflation and political strife produced problems in industry that bordered on class warfare. Most of Germany's great industrialists, Thyssen among them, realized that if economic conditions were not improved soon and class antagonism smothered, they would find themselves engulfed by the tide of a communist revolution. In such a turbulent atmosphere, a charismatic nationalist leader like Hitler seemed like the man of the hour. We were at the worst time of the inflation, said Thyssen in October of 1923 as the money sank in value from one day to the next. Thyssen's support for Hitler at this time should not be overrated. Later in October, during a visit to the home of General Ludendorff, Thyssen gave 100,000 gold marks to the general to distribute between the Nazi party and the Free Corps Oberland. This sum amounted to an absolute fortune in the inflation-torn country. Another important industrialist, Ernst von Borsig, the great locomotive manufacturer, made Hitler's acquaintance at the Berlin National Club in 1922. He was impressed by the Nazi leader's sincerity and his idea of winning the workers back to nationalism. In his position as president of the German Employers' Federation, Borsig was a strong advocate of bringing management and labor together for compromise. The idea of a patriotic workers' party intrigued him, so when the communists began to grow stronger during the inflation he decided to make a contribution to Hitler. By November 1923 the inflation reached nightmare proportions. The mark soared to astronomical figures. A dollar was officially worth 5 trillion marks, unofficially 7 trillion. Banks could no longer afford to count million mark notes, they were simply weighed in bundles or measured with a ruler. Yet there was no way to measure the human misery caused by the inflation. The ruined middle class went hungry and suffered from malnutrition, some were actually starving. The political atmosphere was on the verge of exploding. When Hitler and the Kampfbund leaders learned Carr was planning to declare Bavaria independent, they moved to forestall the separatists with a putsch of their own. On the evening of November 8, von Kahr was speaking to an audience of 3,000 respectable people at the Burger Brau, a first-class beer hall on the outskirts of Munich. Arriving shortly after 8 p.m., Hitler and some of the Nazi leaders pushed their way into the tightly packed hall where Kahr was droning on and on with a boring speech. Meanwhile 600 SA men surrounded the hall from the outside. At 8.30 the elite guard of the SA arrived. Goring with 25 brown shirts burst into the hall and quickly set up a machine gun at the entrance. During the uproar Hitler jumped up on a chair and fired a shot into the ceiling. The national revolution has begun, he shouted. This hall is occupied by 600 heavily armed men. No one may leave the hall. Hitler then invited Carr, 
Lawso and Sisa to come to a side room to discuss plans for a new national government. They refused to comply with his proposals until the arrival of General Ludendorff, who was successful in pressuring them to join Hitler's coup against the Weimar Republic. On the grey morning of November 9 at 6 o'clock, a line of trucks with Gregor Strasser's unit of 150 SA men from Landshut came rolling through Munich. Shortly after 11 o'clock the march of over 2,000 SA men and Free Corps members started from the Bergerbrau, across the Isar River, through the center of the city, and finally down the narrow Residenzstrasse. In the front of the column marched Hitler, Schäuber Richter and Ludendorff. Most all of the troops carried weapons, some even had machine guns. At half past twelve the putschists encountered a cordon of police at the end of the narrow street. Almost instantly a shot rang out, which was followed by a hail of bullets from the police. Sixteen Nazis, including Schäuber Richter, were killed. Ludendorff marched straight through the firing into the ranks of the police. Goring was badly wounded, and Hitler dislocated his shoulder when he fell to the ground. The young SA doctor, Walter Schultz, guided Hitler back to a side street where they hopped into a car and raced out of the city towards the mountains. Two days later Hitler was arrested and imprisoned. His treason trial turned out to be one of the most blatant cover-ups in judicial history, not for his sake, as is often assumed, but to protect the good names of those who financed him, supported him, and intrigued with him. Looking back at the financing of Hitler's political activities from 1918 to 1923, one thing is particularly interesting. Many historians have contended that the National Socialist Party was financed and supported by big business. Yet, as has been seen, only two of Germany's major industrialists, Fritz Thyssen and Ernst von Borsig, gave anything to the Nazi party during these early years. Donations came from some conservative Munich businessmen who gave at the height of the communist danger, as well as small Bavarian factory owners like Grandel, the Berlin piano manufacturer Beckstein, and the publisher Lehman. But none of these men, in spite of their personal wealth, could fit properly in the category of big business. There is absolutely no evidence that the really big industrialists of Germany, such as Karl Bosch, Hermann Beitscher, Karl Friedrich von Siemens, and Hugo Stinnes, or the great families such as the Krupps and the leading bankers and financiers, gave any support to the Nazis from 1918 to 1923. Indeed, few of them knew this small party from Bavaria even existed. Most of Hitler's donations came from wealthy individuals who were radical nationalists or anti-Semites and contributed because of ideological motivation. There was one other important industrialist, in fact the world's largest, who gave to Hitler during this period, but his story must be dealt with in a separate chapter, for he was not a German, but an American. <laughs>